Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode with Homeland Security Today, uh, discussing information warfare. So many of you have seen that Congress is moving forward with uh, perhaps forcing China to sell or divest TikTok, and we really want to explore what's TikTok got to do with it. Uh, today, I'm very excited to welcome Craig Albert, who is a PhD and professor of political science and the graduate director of the Master of Arts in Intelligence and Security Studies at Augusta University. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, well, we're very excited. HS Today is following and informing the conversation around narrative strategy. Uh, and if you've been following us, you'll see that we have Ajit Man, who is one of the foremost experts on narrative strategy in the country. She is one of our uh, editors and columnists on narrative strategy. Uh, and we have a lot of people talking about information warfare. And of course, TikTok is on the top of everyone's mind. Um, it's not a new phenomena. We've had propaganda in the past. You know, in 95, the Rand Corporation uh, did a study for DOD and talked about the use of information warfare. But right now, it's really bubbling up because there's so many ways to bring information to people and for misinformation to spread so quickly. So we wanted to talk with you because, you know, making the case about information warfare and really the harder part of what do you do about it. Uh, I, I don't think we necessarily have the best, clearest strategy. And so today we'd love to talk with you a little bit because you are focusing much of your work on that. So, you know, talk to us about what information warfare is and how it's manifesting in our society right now. Sure, information warfare is a strategy that uh, seeks to influence the decision-making capabilities either, either of leaders or of the citizenry of a, a typically in this setting of a, the international system of a strategic adversary nation state actor. So we can talk about Russia trying to uh, secretly or co covertly get into the minds of American citizens, for instance, or China uh, nation state getting into the minds of American citizens and politicians, for instance, to covertly alter, uh, amplify uh, some type of thinking that we would not otherwise be subjected to or have on our own. So it's very subtle, typically, and the purpose is to make us think a different way than we are or to amplify how we already think towards a more extremist viewpoint uh, to separate us and to exploit divisions in society. That at least is how China and Russia are starting to target the United States. So that's your basic understanding of information warfare. The tactics that fall within information warfare. So if we look at it like through a militaristic understanding, information warfare would kind of be a strategy. And then the tactics or operations are propaganda, misinformation, disinformation, something that now is happening a lot is called malinformation when uh, data is slightly manipulated to tell a different story or uh, an adjustment of a story to amplify a different narrative that the nation state adversary wants to. Uh, and the fastest or quickest way that this informational war is occurring now is, of co course, through social media. So we've always had these tactics of propaganda, for instance, since uh, Sun Tzu wrote about it thousands of years ago. But what's so dangerous about it now is how easily it's spread, how quick it is, how it's amplified. I mean, it's not just new, newspapers now, right? You, If you're on TikTok, it reaches 180 million Americans instantly. Absolutely. And that is that is the danger. And that is what is hard to kind of grasp that misinformation or really information that may be partially true. So that's the other that's the other really tough part is, you know, they take something that's partially true, alter it just a little and put it out there in a different way. Why do you see this and why is Congress focusing on it? Why is this so dangerous? Uh, great question. Uh, nobody's asked me why it's actually dangerous for to have misinformation and disinformation. The reason is because of that the the neuroplasticity pretty much of our thought processes. And so it can interrupt or adjust how American citizens think. So it can alter very subtly at times, other times not subtly, more in your face, but it can alter our viewpoints on democracy. Is democracy good? 
uh, morals or ethics, for instance, uh, one political candidate that we want to vote for. Uh, so, for instance, Russia could try to subjugate a particular part of the American population to shift its viewpoints from wanting to vote for one political party or one candidate, or to be independent, for instance, to completely shift their mindset to another uh, candidate or party. And that's called uh, neurocognitive hacking, where they hack the way you think without you knowing it. And that's the big part, right, is that you're unaware that this is occurring. That's why propaganda is so successful, because you don't know it's occurring. We also see this, which isn't discussed much in the media today from the Middle East. And uh, we have a publication that's about to drop on this now, where we're doing this through several social media forums outside of TikTok, but where we're seeing nation state actors and state affiliated accounts in the Middle East that are capable of targeting microcosms or uh, small groups of individuals, specific demographics in the United States to change the way they think about something. So why it's dangerous is think about the lobby groups or congressional caucuses within Congress or an executive uh, committee for the White House, these small groups that now folks in the Middle East, China and Russia can target just them on some of these platforms and shift their thinking to, let's say, support the war effort in Ukraine or to supply aid to Palestine uh, or not to supply aid in Palestine. Any of these things could be a direct effect on the United States' national security. And it's a, 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 a non-state actor or a state actor that's a strategic adversary of the U.S. that's pushing this forward. So that that is happening everywhere. Uh, and they're, they're inflaming their... Uh, manipulating uh, and individuals, I mean, cognitive dissonance, the the ability or the desire for people to be right and to make their case about what they believe, they're exploiting that to a large degree too. And you see it on both sides. It is not a an us yeah. versus them. Like I see a lot of posts on my social media from friends. I have a diverse group of friends and I'm proud of that. I will always have a diverse group of friends. But you see the way literally it's pointing at the other group and saying, you're doing this. And it's true for both. And it's so, it's so interesting to see. What, what also poses a danger, especially to the United States right now, but other democracies or liberal states, is that uh, for the first time that I can understand from American history, is that uh, all political parties and all individuals are adapting what I call an authoritarian or totalitarian mindset. And so even though we exist in a liberal democracy, both sides or all sides to include the unsighted, right, the, the unpartisan folks, uh, the unchurched folks, right, whatever we're talking about, they're all totalitarian in trying to completely subdue, cancel the thought processes and the right of one to have free expression of the other. And so this is the first time in history, really, we've, we've had it where one side tries to cancel the other throughout American history, or one group tries to oppress the thought processes processes of another group throughout American history. But this is the first time where it's become an operational tactic of all sides involved, where we no longer have free and open discourse. We have discourse that aims to shut down the other completely. And it occurs everywhere, right? It occurs in academia, which is unfortunate because the academy is the one place where complete free and open speech should be allowed, even if it's slightly offensive, as long as it doesn't border on hate, you know, hate speech or, or weaponized speech or something like that. But so now you have the, the propaganda that proliferates social media on top of this kind of uh, authoritarian cognitive dissonance that's, that most Americans are suffering from. That's the danger that is posed from mis, dis, and malinformation. Well, in our history, our liberal arts degrees, everything that America has stood for has been that if you shine the light on bad thinking and approach it in a logical way and disprove it, we should be able to bring in information, process it, and learn. And that's something you just don't hear about anymore. You don't hear about anyone learning anything. You hear about, you know, you're in this vacuum, you're, you're pulling in information and everything you think is right. Well, that's not the case. So talk to us a little bit about how does truth find its way back to the surface? Like where where does the average person go? And, you know, as I mean, 
I'm executive editor of HS Today. You know, we have I have a daughter who's gone through college. She's aware of all of the ways that manipulation happens. But where do you go for the facts? Are there <laughs> that, any more? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a great question. Uh, so this is what I do. Well, first of all, I want to say you, that openness to the marketplace of ideas to sift through distruth or untruth to to give us the light, to give us truth has been something that the United States was framed upon, that's found upon, right? If we go back to Federalist 10, Federalist 51, right? Madison speaks so eloquently about if we have factions, one way that we decrease the dangers of factions is by increasing the number of factions. And that includes news presses, right? That includes types of media that you increase them. So one type of media conglomerate doesn't form that can have a tyranny over the, the thinking process of America. The famous French uh, political philosopher, perhaps the, the great uh, architect of understanding the American constitution, Alexis de Tocqueville, states kind of very similarly of, in order to avoid tyranny of the majority or any type of authoritarian thought processes, you have to have free associations and, and a free press open to the marketplace of ideas. The problem of reading Tocqueville today and Madison today is that they had no idea of social media and the internet and how much information we would have that kind of inundates us and almost paralyzes us in a state of like fight or fright fight where we don't know what's true or not true. So the really only way that policy wise we can sift through this is kind of twofold. One is back to individual citizen responsibility. So when my students say, how do I know what the truth is? I give them this thing that I do. And of course, I realize I do this for a living and not everybody has the time, but I take five sources and go through those five sources on the same story. So I'll go BBC, Fox News, CNN, Reuters and AP, Reuters and AP generally are just the facts, no editorializing or reporting most of the time. Uh, and I say, whatever the common denominator between those five websites are, are probably close to a form of the truth. And you can probably go ahead and bet that that's what's going on. And then any way they differ, don't make your mind up about the situations and how they differ. So that's the first thing is that we have to you know, we can't just trust one source anymore. And if it's on social media, we shouldn't trust it at all. I, I, it's, I used to say, uh, not to be partisan, but to quote Reagan, you know, tr trust but verify when it comes to your news sources. I don't even say that anymore. It's, it's don't trust, just verify, verify, verify before you make a point, uh, a decision point in your mind. The other thing that I think we can do, which is, is something I'm starting to write in most of my papers now, is we need a revamping of the K through 12 education system uh, by, of course, uh, adjusting for a state by state understanding of how they operate their boards of education and everything. But each state, I argue, should implement a K through 12 cyber hygiene policy uh, in K through 12 that includes information and digital literacy. So it also, it, it would take care of things like cyber bullying, cyber phishing, all these things that a K through 12 population need to know, but it would also teach mis, dis, and malinformation to that population so that when they become 18 and are able to make critical decisions for the United States, they can sift through, at least to some extent, the different levels of truthiness uh, that are out there. And that's something that we really, as a society, need to start taking seriously as policy at the K through 12 educational policy to handle this. Uh, for for adults, it's just good old civic engagement. Like we have to start having discourse again. Uh, we need to remember that it's awesome to be proven wrong because then we're stepping closer to the truth. And so we need to engage in dialogue and debate with those with whom we disagree. Those are the only ways we can really sift through this informational campaign without, you know, potentially getting into civic chaos with one another. I could not agree with you more. And when you, because to, to do any of this, you need to be able to think critically and you need to have the truth as the goal, not be only set into what you believe or think. Um, there, there is such a thing as external, you know, you're telling that the trees are blue, but you're like, no, actually the trees are green. And that's a fact exchange. That's not an opinion thing. So I, there are a lot of ways that 
absolutely education is going to to help us do that so when you're talking to these young people and we're we're trying to back up what congress is trying to do <laughs> what do you say about tiktok specifically and what tiktok has to do with it that's kind sure. of my you know that song what's love got to do with it what's tiktok got to do with it <laughs> Absolutely. So TikTok poses several dangers to the U.S. national security. The first is that it's a data collection uh, portfolio mine. Uh, if you're on TikTok, uh, you have given the Chinese Communist Party, which owns TikTok through a private corporation called ByteDance, that by Chinese law has to report all data it collects to the Chinese Communist Party at the whim of the Chinese Communist Party. So whenever they call for it, ByteDance, by Chinese law under which they operate, has to give that data over to the Chinese Communist Party. So one might say, and I get this all the time, my students say, so what if they have my data? Like everybody has my data. And I say, well, great, great point. But TikTok's algorithm is such that it can be uh, ch changed. That's how the, so the algorithm is what uh, creates or decides what Inf information you get from a social media site, right? It determines what what uh, uh, pages you're given, what influencers you're given, what accounts, what ads, everything like that is determined by the algorithm. Typically, before you get on it, it chooses the algorithm based on your demographic, right? So I'm in my 40s, I'm a white male. It, to begin with, is going to shoot out a particular demographic until it sees what I scroll on, how long I stay on something, a particular image or a particular influencer, and then it starts shifting its algorithm. So it learns you. It also is automatically connected to all the other apps on your phone, which makes it very dangerous. So it's connected to, first of all, your camera, your microphone, it's connected to your email, it's connected to your bank. And if you give it third party access and you give all your other apps this third party access rights, which most of them have, and we don't read the, the policy that says we're giving them the rights to look at everything on our phone, they now have a complete intellig intelligence portfolio of who you are. And I mean, absolutely complete. So they know your emotional state of mind. They know your banking history, your banking account. They know if you're in debt or not. They know your sexual orientation and preferences, what foods you like, uh, what music you like. With that type of knowledge in the hand of what most foreign policy experts say is the strategic adversary most likely to be at war with the United States by the year 2050, you're talking about giving a, a, a perfect weapon to a strategic adversary to use to preempt any type of warfare, to set the conditions or the tone or what we call battlefield conditions in uh, war studies, they're setting the conditions that favor them over the United States by being able to change the thought processes of all people on TikTok through the algorithm and the data that they're able to collect. So that's one of the most dangers that, uh, that TikTok presents to us. Uh, of course, we don't know that's going on, right? That's the beauty of disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation with propaganda is that typically to be successful, it has to be subtle. So they'll subtly push out some type of agenda to you uh, that you're not aware that you're that that's happening. And neurocognitively in your brain, without you knowing it, is actually a, actually being shifted and shaped to adapt to a new type of thinking or to a new fact pattern in your head. That's how dangerous propaganda it is. That can literally reshape the neurons and the synapses and the form of your brain to adapt to a different message. So it's very serious the way it can operate, especially if you look at eye movement and the psychological sciences and things like that. It operates through scientific uh, biology in the human person, which is like terrifying that it can just do that. So, and then a, a corollary of that is because they have all your information they're, they're more able to uh, target phishing scams or other type of cyber attacks to folks on TikTok. And so this is a huge danger that we don't often talk about either with TikTok. And so if, if they target you and you click a text that's from them because they know who you are specifically. So I'll give an example, right? Uh, I like to run. I'm an endurance runner. So they send to me, somebody sends me all kinds of 90% off Nike running shoes, right? And it looks like it's coming from Nike, right? So this is what I do for a living. And I'm telling you, almost every time, like I'm going to click it and then I'm like, no, this is not real. Like Nike is not having a 90% off sale, right? So, but if I click it and I click it at school, my university is a health science university uh, attached to a liberal arts university. So it has all the uh, university aspects. 
since it's a health sciences university, we have a medical college attached to it. That means if I click that link that the Chinese Communist Party purposely crafted for me to individually click, they're in the Wi-Fi system of the university. If they're in the Wi-Fi system, they now have access to everything on the servers at the university, including medical records for the hospital part. If they have all that information, go one step level, uh, further, they have all the information for who at that medical university has pacemakers that are connected to the Internet of Things. Take that one step further. If they go to war with the United States or want to do something to drastically shut down the United States, they can target what high profile persons have pacemakers at this university. Now draw the conclusion from what they can do for that. Right. That's how dangerous it is. And we're just not talking about how dangerous TikTok is in this way. So it's dangerous through twofolds through information warfare and then cyber attacks that target those that have succumbed to the informational warfare. Together, this is called cyber enabled influence uh, operations, where it's a cyber attack that was generated because of an informational attack. Yeah, it's terrifying. I'm not even gonna ask you how AI plays in and magnifies <laughs> all of that because we'll be here all day, but I could talk to you all day. Uh, so I, I know that you have limited time with us, but we're looking forward to a written piece to follow up with this at HSA. Absolutely. Very excited about that. But what do you see as some of the ways we can combat this? Because one of the things that I really uh, enjoyed about reading about your work is that you weren't just kind of raising all these red flags that it's easy to do, but you you made some suggestions on on how we could start addressing these things. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And, and, and I encourage other academics, we're not being useful if we don't suggest policies moving forward, especially if we're not connecting to theory to policy. So the first thing that's not in the papers, any university professor teaching this has to engage in policymaking uh, activities with the students. So that's the first thing. We get the students to start thinking about policies as well. But more pointedly to your question, uh, there are several steps that the United States can take. The first is the United States needs to start being aggressive and assertive and go on the offense with information warfare. This is something that's you know, debated very vigorously because the idea of a democratic republic engaging in propaganda operations offensively tends to make people feel uncomfortable. But the way this happens is that, of course, it would act through the proper authorities, uh, either through the DOD, if it's targeting foreign adversaries, right? There's nothing wrong with the DOD going after the Chinese Communist Party in China very aggressively uh, and trying to get into their social media uh, networks and their influencers the way China does for us. So one thing that China does through, so brilliantly through TikTok is hires Americans to push their agendas on TikTok in America. There's no reason the U.S. can't try to do the same type of kind of informational espionage by paying folks in China to become influencers to kind of give uh, they'll be arrested very quickly if they give U.S. agendas, but to try to do something a little bit different than the Chinese uh, state messaging for uh, issues that they care about closer to home, such as Hong Kong, such as the Uyghur crisis, such as uh, um, uh, Taiwan, right? So China and its home population pushes a certain agenda, push a certain narrative to those regions. So we could hire very clandestinely folks to to slightly adjust the narrative to those images and hope that 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 starts to make a change. The other thing that we can do is that the DOD has something that's in its informational doctrine that's called inform. This is a way that the DOD can engage with the United States very clearly is to inform the public of what's going on. That doesn't break any type of laws. There's no uh, violation of privacy rights. It's just Good old PR of the United States Army, for instance, saying, hey, this is the danger that TikTok poses. This is the danger of information, you know, generally. So we're not going to establish a truth police. We're just going to let you know that there's a such thing as um, mistruth and distruth and to be aware of it. And here's some strategies on how, how to uh, tackle it. And they can do this very easily without getting controversial or without getting uh, partisan. They could just take a deep fake generated by AI and show uh, Americans informationally on their websites how to spot distortions and deep fakes so that you know that it's probably a fake picture, right? And there's th this has come out of the Hamas-Israeli situation so clearly in the past several weeks where uh, they, they show a picture of a kid that was brutalized by the IDF when in actuality you see that the kid has six fingers, uh, 
like something's distorted in it. If you look very clearly, you can tell that, wait a minute, that that's not a real uh, picture. Or there's things in the background, like a Ukrainian factory, right? And so you're like, well, this bombing didn't take place in Gaza because that clearly is in Mariupol in Ukraine, and that's several years old. So the army specifically has this intent of to inform the public and they can start doing it much more actively. And then thirdly, I think the United States needs to empower its armed services to ha have influencers within the United States just showing how awesome democracy is, what type of human rights we promote. It doesn't have to be DOD. It can be, be done by the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, right? If people are worried about the DOD operating in the domestic sphere, it can be the Department of State. We could create some type of new organization or new institution that just seeks to, to be more proactive rather than reactive. The problem with narrative fighting, and this is what China and Russia are both winning, this is how ISIS recruits from the United States on social media, right, is setting the agenda, setting the narrative, setting the tone. The United States is consistently playing backup, playing defense uh, against these non-state and state actors saying that democracy isn't as good as you think it is. Rather, we need to stop playing backup and catch up and start playing offense and saying, no, democracy is good for these reasons. These are the awesome things the U.S. does worldwide. Uh, uh, these are what we do to promote human rights. This is why freedom of speech, freedom of expression, everything that we hold true in the Constitution is so awesome. So it's little things like that that the United States can do that can make such a huge difference in the information domain space. Well, and really, those aren't little things. Like we have neglected those things for way too long. And so now, I mean, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, um, America being bad, America this, America that. And and I think people don't realize that since the 40s and 50s, Russia has actually had a campaign to convince Americans that our judicial system is bad, that our judicial system is unfair. And that's been happening way before social media. So social media just amplifies. And like you said, exactly. you teach people. I think people do look for places. And that's why I ask the question, what does the average person do? Because you you check five sources. I try and do the same. But even just headlines can be so misleading and wow. so and plant in your brain. And the truth is the we we don't talk about it much but the mon the influence of money on us media and the fact that they have to make money and they have to make money and they have to make money they put out stories that really aren't stories to get clicks and that tyranny of the click works against us as well so we have a lot of death by a million cuts uh, and then social media just magnifies that so uh, it's great to hear that there are places you know that the People could go, and I think DOD and some of the others are starting to engage on a higher level, um, but they're very, very risk averse. Yes, and you know, I, on Twitter, for instance, uh, different elements of the U.S. Army are are very active and in given information. I recommend everybody following the 780th Brigade. Um, it's a military intelligence brigade from the U.S. Army and the Cyber uh, Military Intelligence Brigade, and they. Uh, put out and repost publications about how Chinese, the, uh, the Chinese nation state is acting, how the Russia nation state is acting, not army doctrine, uh, but actual publications from RAND, for instance, from different corporations in the United States. They'll throw that information out there. Uh, I think they just need to re-image themselves to be more appealing to, to non-military uh, uh, practitioners or, or uh folks that study the military and say, hey, follow us, even if you're just, you know, a college student, because we're giving you this type of information and that can help uh, greatly. By the way, I'm just going to announce this live uh, for, for you and your audience. I'm taking that tyranny of the click to use as my next title of whatever piece I publish next. Oh, because wow, that is that's awesome. So brilliant. That is a, a wonderful way of thinking about it. The tyranny of the click is absolutely uh, accurate. And if I can just say one more thing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm long-winded. I get so impassioned and enthusiastic about this. We love uh, it. Is it. You're absolutely right. The average college student today, and it, it's going to be remarkable here, has a reading span of seven words. Uh, seven words, and then they lose their attention span. Uh, so what does that mean? Exactly what you were stated earlier, that they read the headlines, and that's the story to them. And so another quick, simple thing we can do, parents can do, starting with their high schoolers, right, is uh, no, you read the whole story. 
and and make sure that the that you can understand the point of this story and whether or not there might be any editorializing or subjectivity in this story. And you can kind of tell that already by the way that a story is titled, if it's gonna tilt one way or another. Uh, and so that's something very quick and easy parents can teach their children, uh, spending quality time with their uh, children on education and teaching, you read the whole story, get back some more of your attention span, don't read just the headlines, this has happened to me when I've written some op-eds at places and they've completely just, you know, when you write an op-ed for a newspaper, they have editorial rights so they can change the title however they want. And I've been flabbergasted that, like, wow, they've completely changed like the tone of my story. And so I make students aware of that. And that's something that we can just generally in our conversations with people let them know as well. Like you can't just read the headlines because sometimes to make money as clickbait, they change the headlines so that you click on. And often this, the point of this story is, opposite of what the, the clickbait headline is. And so that's something that, that that parents can teach their children. They don't even need to, to do it in a K through 12 or a college situation. Well, I think, unfortunately, the parents are doing it too, because who has time to read every that's article, right. right? You get aggregates of articles, you scroll through those headlines, you see what you see. And whether you're conscious of it or not, those headlines sink into your brain. And the story right. can be completely different. But you don't have time to click on every single article and you look to aggregators to help you parse through all the information that's coming at you because you you literally as a human being can't read every article and see everything. So that role of aggregator becomes incredibly crucial uh, and how things are characterized. Uh, but you know, it is that you get paid by who clicks and how many clicks you get on your website. And as long as that's an incentive that uh, it's a negative incentive because it yeah. doesn't have to, you know, it, it sensational stuff gets reads, it gets looks, it gets clicks. So it's a, we have our, our, what our fight cut out for us. Uh, there's a lot oh, of yeah. ways that it's, it's very, very difficult. Well, let me ask you, I know, I know you're limited today. We really want to invite you back. Uh, please, what is your kind of parting advice for uh, folks thinking about TikTok or thinking about uh, the way they can educate themselves and be sure they're not part of the problem. For, for every social media app they're on or every day that they're uh, scrolling through something, they should read a classical text uh, as soon as they put their phone down to balance out their negative uh, emotional state and the propaganda that they get. And uh, I think it's very important that uh, we start to invest in a return to the classic literature, for instance, as entertainment in this country uh, there's something wrong with, uh, I don't want to sound partisan because I'm not, as an academic, I'm trained to be completely objective, but some academics are partisan, and I'm going to name an, ag an academic that comes across as partisan, but I think his point is very, very clear, is, is Harvey Mansfield out at Harvard, and his idea is that we have to return to the classics, the, the texts that will show us the truth, because there's some types of universal truths through thousand-year-old manuscripts that will help us sift through any problems within what Harvey Mansfield calls the constitutional soul. So, it, so it's not even a religious matter. I'm, I'm using that word philosophically. It's the philosophical soul. So we're scrolling so much on these things because we're not filling our constitutional souls, our hearts with enlightened information that the American mind was created upon, that the constitution was framed upon. And so a return to reading a classical essay or a classical poem or anything, by classic, I mean something that's timeless, right? Uh, uh, every, every American should read the Federalist Papers. Uh, so if you're on TikTok, for every hour you spend on that, you should read uh, a page or two of the Federalist Papers to combat that. Or every person that lives in America should read Democracy in America by Tocqueville. And it's, for any 101 students, that's the intro to American government here at uh, Augusta University. I don't assign a textbook. I sign all 776 pages of Democracy in America. And that's what we use as our source because it teaches you so much about the truth uh, and beauty of what the framers were trying to do, as well as the flaws uh, embedded within a democratic republic. And so I, I really, I know that sounds cheesy and it's unlikely that people do that, but if we can start this conversation of let's return to entertainment as getting back in touch with uh, the true beauty of things, we won't be searching for false beauty on social media. 
That is such an incredible point. And I, I mean, I personally couldn't agree more. I believe that the, um, those texts also contain what I would call universal human truths that transcend a lot of the fights we're having today. Uh, you know, happiness, having a child, love, all of these things that social media does not get across uh, and that social media increases that anxiety. As a matter of fact, they just came out yeah. with a study that talked about attention span and how, you know, they've reduced the SAT by 45 minutes. They've reduced the reading comprehension blocks because they can't read and comprehend for a whole paragraph anymore. Um, that's terrifying. Uh, and the solution yeah. is getting away from social media. So, you know, absolutely reading a classic text, reading any text, reading a whole book in your hands, uh, and then going outside and not being on social media at all uh, will will help us on every level. But that I will invite you to join us for another webinar so we can talk about the me mental and cognitive effects of social media. I would love that. Um, you have just been a pleasure. Great, great, great to talk to you and so glad to have you in, in the Homeland Security Today orbit. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been my honor and it, it was awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. And again, we look forward to your piece. Uh, please do subscribe at www.hstoday.us. All of our publications, all of our webinars are free. They're here to support the Homeland community and to support the American public to understand the, the very critical Homeland security challenges the, face, the, the nation is facing. Uh, I like to say everything, everywhere, all at once. That movie uh, and that saying for the federal government, for our citizens, uh, we're, we're inundated on a number of levels and we hope homeland security today is a place you turn to parse some of those details so again thank you dr albert you've been just tremendous uh and everyone have a good safe day thank you so much for joining us